Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, or good day, wherever you are. Welcome to Why China Matters to the Heartland, a special event brought to you by the United States Heartland China Association. My name is Min Fan. I'm the executive director of U.S. Heartland China Association, which is a mouthful. So we also call it USHCA. And our mission is to promote productive, positive, and mutually beneficial relationships between the people of the U.S. heartland and China, and we promote changes in culture, education, and business. This event launches our second installment of Why China Matters Heartland Report. We are so excited you are able to join us today. This project started one, about two years ago. One of our community leaders came to us asking, do you have a quick summary of how our state related to China in different ways? And we couldn't find all the data in one place. So that started a journey that led us to reach out to partners throughout 21 states to bring to you an easily accessible resource. And we have a great lineup today. You get to hear from many of the people who actually provided insights, the data, and the knowledge. And without further ado, I'm going to welcome uh, the, the chairman and president of our organization, former governor of Missouri, Bob Holden, to give opening remarks. Thank you, Ben, and thank you to everybody joining us for this first event in 2023. I would like to begin by recognizing many organizations and individuals who have helped us along the way. As, as Min said, outreach has been a tremendously important part of our research, enabling us to share on the ground insight from leaders working in the US-China space. This project has benefited immensely from your knowledge and advice, and we are deeply grateful. I am proud of both the combined efforts of the Heartland community in making this report possible, as well as the picture of the Heartland that it presents. During my time as the chairman of the Midwest Governors Association, I watched as many businesses left our region for what they believed were greater opportunities for their community and their business interests. What was striking to me was how few people could see the opportunities and advantages here in our very own backyard. Our region is incredibly competitive economically. The rich soil and the abundance of our crops has earned us the name the breadbasket of the world, and our farmers and businesses have made us an agricultural powerhouse. Our manufacturing sector is dynamic and expansive with over 400 Fortune 1000 companies headquartered here in our region. Additionally, we have produced many past and current leaders which have shaped international policy. The facts, the figures, and the stories contained within this report demonstrates the incredible past, present, and future of the heartland, both in US-China relations as well as the global arena. The strength of our mutual trade, the longstanding cultural ties, and the legacy of diplomacy and collaboration between our region and China cannot be overstated. The United States-China relationship is without question the most important bilateral relationship of the 21st century, and the heartland must have a seat at the table. It is incredible that we continue to expand opportunities and expand relationships with China, which is the second largest economy and one of the most populous countries in our times. There is no magic pill that is going to solve the problems between our two countries. But we are confident that through people-to-people -people exchanges in culture and education and business, mutual understanding can be rebuilt. Now I'd like to turn to Jason so that he can introduce the rest of our program. And I'm looking forward to this wonderful discussion with all of these outstanding participants here this evening. Thank you very much. And Jason, it's yours. Thank you, Governor Holden. And in addition to thanking all of our partners and sponsors, I really want to thank the USHGA staff that worked so hard on this report. I've had a chance to review it. It really is so informative and very well done. Um, so there were a lot of things that I learned in the report that I thought may be an interesting way to kind of get this webinar started. So I'm going to be sharing a poll 
and it should appear on your screens. Um, there are four questions. Feel free to answer them at your leisure. This is kind of just to get the juices flowing and see um, what it is our audience knows about the Heartland. So uh, the first question may surprise you. And the question is, how many Heartland states count China as their number one export market? Uh, you can answer with 12, 11, 2, or 10. Um, the second question is, which Heartland state led in the region for exporting of oil seeds and grains to China in, two, in 2021 in terms of total revenue? Uh, the options are Arkansas, Kansas, Illinois, and Iowa. Uh, question three, which Heartland state has the highest percentage of international students originating from China? So not which state has the most, which state has the highest percentage. Um, which Heartland state has the older sister city relationship in the region? The options are Missouri with St. Louis and Nanjing relationship, Iowa with the Des Moines and Shijiazhuang relationship, Illinois with the Chicago and Shanghai relationship, or Colorado with the Denver Quinling relationship. Thank you, Jason. Um, I, I see uh, we have some participation. I assume you have all the answers, right? Yes, I do. So um, I'll go ahead and reveal the answers now. So the answer to the first question. How many Heartland states count China as their number one export market? The answer is two. And it may surprise you that those states are Nebraska and South Dakota. And yeah, it looks like um, actually most people thought it was 12 or 11. So I'm, I'm glad you think the relationship's that good. So uh, the second question, which Heartland state led in the region for exporting of oil seeds and grains to China in 21, 2021 in terms of total revenue? Um, so most people put down Iowa. The actual answer is Illinois at 2.9 billion. For the third question, which Heartland State has the highest percentage of international students originating from China? So Illinois does have the most, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, but the correct answer for percentage is actually Wisconsin. And I'm sure that Samantha will be able to tell us a lot more about that later. So uh, the last question, uh, which state has the older sister city, oldest sister city relationship in the Heartland region? And uh, we got it. The answer is Missouri with St. Louis and Nanjing. So um, I think we'll be able to share those poll results later if anyone wants to look at them. But um, that, is, that is the end of the poll. So now I'm going to hand it back over to Ellen, who played such an instrumental role in writing the report this year. So um, Ellen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jason. Hello, everyone. My name is Ellen Wright. I am a program associate with USHCA. Through our Why China Matters project, we attempt to provide a brief overview of the economic, political, and cultural relations between China and the Heartland states. This includes export data, the estimated number of Chinese international students per state, sister city relationships, and so on. As mentioned, we have also been interviewing experts across the Heartland. I'd like to share with you some regional trends. On the left, our sidebar provides greater context to the Heartland region's ties with China. For example, in the Heartland state's list of top global trading partners in 2021, China generally ranks as third, usually after Canada and Mexico. The right-hand side provides key statistics. 2021 was in fact the highest year ever recorded for trade between the US and China, with the 21 Heartland states generating half of the national goods export total revenue. Service exports to China, however, saw a decline in 2022 due to the pandemic, as the halt of Chinese tourism was a significant loss to Heartland states. We have compiled a list of major Chinese companies operating in the region. A few notable examples include Wanxiang America or Fuyao Glass, of which Amy Lei will be representing this evening. The effect of the pandemic is also felt in the Heartland states educational ties with China. The total number of Chinese international students dropped, so states like Illinois, with high amounts of students originating from China, lost millions in revenue. Chinese Americans of the Heartland region total above 840,000, with Asian Americans being one of the fastest growing demographics in the U.S. The pandemic has also impacted states' sister city relationships, many of which have been unable to host delegations during this time, forcing many to rely on virtual alternatives. We hope that this data will serve to highlight the tremendous importance that the U.S.-China relationship has to the Heartland region as a whole, as well as on a state-by-state -state basis. I look forward to hearing from our speakers as they share more about what China means to their own states. Min, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you again for your leadership in this project. 
And again, so proud of our young but talented team. So thank you, Jason. Thank you, Alan. So Alan, who do we have coming to speak on behalf of Illinois? We have uh, three speakers coming from Illinois. We have pre-recorded marks coming from Mayor of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot. We also have Carla Orozco with World Business Chicago. And we also have pre-recorded marks from Mary Ma, who is, from, who is the managing director of the state of Illinois China office. Good evening, everyone. I'm Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot. Chicago is home to nearly 120 Chinese-based companies in the area, creating thousands of jobs for Illinoisans and beyond. And notably, CRRC, Sifang America, headquartered here in Chicago, is making headlines as they bring rail car production back to Chicago after a more than 50-year absence. Just this year, CRRC delivered its first 400 L cars for the CTA built from their Chicago factory in the Calumet neighborhood. From that factory, CRRC created 200 middle-class manufacturing jobs and an incredible economic impact on our southeast side of our city. CRRC is one example of our shared economic interest and commitment to reopening the future. We are so proud to have two sister cities in China, Shanghai and Shenyang, and to have an eight-city gateway agreement. As we join together for this celebration, please know that Chicago is ready to support continued investments from Chinese companies in Chicago. So I'm sorry I could not be there with you in person for tonight's event, but I want to wish you a very happy and successful evening. And I look forward to doing my part to further our economic growth and prosperity and relationship. Thank you. Enjoy the evening. Great. So good evening, America. Sao Shan Hao, Ye Xin Yan Kwai Lo. I hope you enjoy, you will enjoy the warm remarks of Lori, our Mayor Lori Lightful. It is a pleasure to be here. As you said, uh, the relationships between China and Chicago are very important. So I'm so glad to be able to be sharing this with you. I don't know if you can see my next slide. It seems there is some problem there. Okay. Uh, for those that don't know World Business Chicago, uh, it, there, it is a public private economic development agency and our vision is to make Chicago the most business friendly area we will like to be and become a role model for truly inclusive equity in all the business ecosystem to have all our communities and partners prosper in this region. So why China matters to Chicago? That's the question that we have today. So, I don't know why it keeps, okay. So China has had strong bilateral relations for decades. As soon as the US and China formalized their, their relationship, Chicago companies have begun to operate in China. We recognize that China, it's a major investor. Chicago is home to over 400 major corporations and there are around 120 Chinese-based company employing more than 4,000 local people. Some examples include Wangxiang, Goldwing, Bank of China, Hainan Airlines, among others. And I would like to focus on a recent example, CRRC, Sinfang America Investment. They built a transit rail car plant on the south side of Chicago. We appreciate the remarkable work creating employment, improving the livelihood of the communities, and providing Chicago with one of the youngest fleets of any US transit system. For those familiar with Chicago CTA, these rail cars will be on, on the blue line. Uh, 
<laughs> so another important project to talk about and actually exemplify the relationship between China and Chicago. First, the Chicago-China Getaway Cities Agreement signed in 2013. So we will be celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. Uh, this agreement is a specific framework of cooperation between Chicago and eight cities in China, Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, Qingdao, Shenyan, Hangzhou, Hunan, and Chengdu. Chicago was the first Chinese US gateway city for investment and tourism. And I must say that this partnership has proven to be resilient because even during the pandemic, we had important achievements. Second, Chicago sister cities hold agreements with 29 cities, two of them with China, Shanghai and Shenyang. And it is the only country with whom Chicago has more than one sister cities relation. Third, the development of talent, especially among young generations. Chinese students lead foreign enrollment at Illinois Institutes of Higher Education, 35% of the total. This is an important aspect for economic and social prosperity. As you can see, Chicago and China have a long-standing economic relationship, but let's keep working together. In this slide, you can see some of the main attributes that third parties have said about Chicago, recognizing its importance. I would like to highlight four aspects. Chicago's business climate, transformation is a core part of Chicago's identity and help establish the city as a global economic powerhouse. Innovations lives in Chicago. It is home to the world's most advanced computing and op optical network facilities. We have talent within reach. Chicago business have access to the world's best talent across industries at a very competitive cost. And of course, we have the workforce of the future. Chicago is the number one destination for Midwest talent. As an important aspect is that Chicago is building a strong partnership across all industries and ecosystems here in the US and of course in other countries considering China one of the most important ones. Chicago is pioneer the future of life science and healthcare attracting the best and the brightest. We are the nation's food innovation capital. Close to 400 companies has their headquarters in Illinois. We are leaders in all things transportation O'Hare has the nation number one port by trade value in 2021. We are capturing the momentum of financial technologies. Over 300 companies are part of Chicago's FinTech ecosystem. Uh, with this slide, I just want to get you a picture of how Chicago is uh, uh, getting away to the Midwest and of course, how we can partner with, our, uh, uh, with other states around the region and the opportunities that this create regarding logistics, density of warehouses, talent, market, and others. Finally, there is a recent partnership I would like to highlight, the Greater Chicagoland Economic Partnership. This partnership is a new collaboration among seven counties of Northeastern Illinois, Cook, DuPage, Kane, Kendall, Lake, McHenry and Will and the city of Chicago to drive economic growth and advance equity across the region and its diverse communities. This partnership increases the population from 2.7 million people to 10 million and provide companies with the opportunity to choose between investing in urban, suburban or rural ecosystems. Thank you, Carla, for the wonderful presentation. Um, I know a lot of uh, friends we know are headed towards uh, Chicago, and but I, we will actually have representatives from other states very soon uh, to share the benefits of their uh, community as well. But thank you, Carla. Thank you very much. And next, we're going to welcome 
Mary Ma. And in the interest of time, Jason, I think please let's play uh, Mary Ma's pre recorded remarks. Thank you again, Carla. Hi, good morning and good evening, everyone. First, I want to say Happy New Year to everyone. Hope, wish you have all the best in the year of the rabbit. So my name is Mary Ma. I'm the managing director of Stable Noi China office. So I'm very happy and honored to have an opportunity to share our programs. So my topic is why um, China is matters to Illinois and some investment opportunity in Illinois. So let me share my screen here. So actually, um, so Stable Noi have a long history of relationship uh, with China. So uh, since, since 1982, so Stable Illinois have established uh, sister state relations with Liaoning province, which is uh, located in Northeast China. So during the 40 years, so we have promoted many programs. So covering the economy and trade investment, agriculture, education, and uh, also culture communications. So in 1985, the city of Chicago has established the sister city relations with the Shanghai, with the city of Shanghai and Shenyang. And also in 2000, our uh, Stable Illinois China office was officially opened in Shanghai. So actually our Hong Kong office was set up in um, 1974. It's the first US states have print, uh, footprint in China. So just some pictures, we show you the programs we have done uh, during the past years. So this is a picture we took from the IE Expo. So our China office have organized more than six business delegations from Illinois to China for environmental sectors. So you can see as many uh, business leaders from Illinois, they attend the trade show in Shanghai, and also they achieved many um, the big good result for the export uh, business achievement. And due to the COVID in past years, past three years actually, so we host more than uh, 10 or uh, 15 virtual business uh, matchmaking events between the Illinois business and their potential Chinese partners and agents. So for the education exchange program, so we also uh, arranged more than uh, you know six delegations for the Illinois Higher Education Trade Mission to China during 2013 to 2019. So this picture we took in, in 2019. So we visit uh, the Chinese University in Shenyang, Beijing, and Hefei, uh, Hefei in Anhui Province, and also the state, uh, Illinois State University. Uh, have signed MOU with Shenyang University of Technology at that time. So some trade and investment numbers between Illinois and China. So China is Illinois' fourth largest export market. So we um, export totally $6 billion in 2021. And also China is the largest import market for Illinois. So we uh, import from China is totally $60 billion. Um, in 2021 as well. The so top um, export industry and sectors, uh, they are agriculture uh, products, chemical products, computer and electronic products, machinery and the equipment, um, transportation equipment. So the second part, we also want to show you um, the investment opportunity for Illinois. So Illinois is 18th largest economy in the world. Actually, last year, our GDP have reached to uh, $1 trillion. So um, for the whole states, we export um, more than $60 billion in 2021. And there's 800,000 Illinois jobs is supported by export activities. And Illinois is the third state in the US for new and expanding uh, companies. So Illinois is also the global headquarters hub. So 33 Fortune 500 companies and the 30 S&P 500 companies are located in Illinois. So they have many well-known uh, big brands, you know, um, the home in Chicago, like ADM, Abbott, and McDonald. We also have outstanding higher education resources. So Illinois has nearly 4, uh, 46,000 international students. And among them is 15,300 is from China. And two of top 
top 10 universities in the US are from Illinois. They are University of Chicago and the Northwestern University. It's also very popular in China as well. So Illinois is also a global connection hub. So we have nonstop flights to 46 global hubs and also four hour flights um, can be reached to uh, most destinations in North America. So Illinois is also it's a container hub. <clears throat> so we have a world-class um, you know, uh, transportation facilities. So in Joliet, uh, Illinois, they have they are, have a third largest intermodal port in the world. So every day they have thousand containers move in and move out. So Illinois is also the R&D hub. Um, they have more than 861 spaces available to innovators across the states. Not only for business. So State Illinois is also, um, you know, it's a sports program and the musical programs. So the Chicago Blackhawks captured three Stanley Cups in uh, within six years. So there are many, uh, you know, and um, activities in during the summer at Chicago downtown. So how can we help you? So we are your one-stop resources. So as I mentioned, our uh, China office, we focus on two programs. One is the trade promotion, and the other is um, attracting more Chinese investors, uh, expanding their business in Illinois. So we provide uh, set selection services and also uh, provide more potential incentives and to collaborate with our Chinese clients. So the last page, I just share my uh, contact info um, you know, here. So we look forward to working with everyone to promote more uh, contractive program. And, the, and also we promote more program, programs to enhance US and China relations. And last, I uh, wish everyone all the best in the new year. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Marima. And thank you, Jason, for pointing that. Uh, I have to say, I uh, the McDonald's I, I've seen in Beijing and Shanghai are pretty full here. So I think that Illinois is definitely uh, continue to benefit from that. Now I'm going to shift the gear to another great state. Again, there are 21 states, each one very unique. Uh, but we are so excited that we have a very strong lineup from Wisconsin. First, we have Mayor Katie Rosenberg. The mayor was Sioux, Wisconsin. Mayor, please. Why China matters to your city? All right, I think I unmuted myself. I'm trying to make sure that I'm actually looking at your camera while I'm talking. All right, hello. Um, I'm relatively new to this um, organization and these folks, but just thank you so much for inviting me. Happy New Year. Um, thank you, Governor Holden, Min, uh, Jason. Hey, this has been really... Oh, your, your been... slide went away. Oh, it went away? How about this? You got it now? No, we got it. Okay, well, this is going to be weird. Cool, I got it. All right, so Wausau, Wisconsin, uh, you probably saw on that map earlier, Chicago uh, kind of radiating out. You saw Madison and Milwaukee and about maybe 130 miles north of Madison. That's where we are in Wausau, Wisconsin, right in the middle of the state. Um, it's a great place for all kinds of things, um, but we're not very big. Um, I'm Katie Rosenberg. I was elected in April 2020, so right in the middle of the pandemic. We're learning as we go. Um, so a little bit about Wausau. Uh, we're about 40,000 people in our city. Um, and then Marathon County, we are the county seat, um, but there's about 138,000 residents in Marathon County. Um, one of the neat things about Wausau is that our population is 11.7% Hmong. Um, so if you know anything about um, the Vietnam War, the Hmong were American allies during that war, um, and they came to uh, America and specifically uh, central Wisconsin as refugees. So we're really lucky to have um, all kinds of interesting cultural um, activities and things, um, thanks to them. Our economy is largely manufacturing, um, but we also have lots of medical, agriculture, service, and tourism. We have a state park uh, just minutes away from Wassa where you can go skiing right now uh, since it's six degrees outside and we have tons of snow. Um, but lot, we have three different hospital systems. Um, and then agriculture, which I'm going to get into a little bit right here. Uh, oh, just kidding. I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, like everywhere, uh, we are looking for people. Uh, we know that the Midwest is losing people to other places, maybe that are warmer uh, in the winter. Um, maybe they're finding other opportunities in other places. So we're still looking for people. We want people to move here. Uh, the cost of living, it, relatively speaking, is uh, pretty reasonable. 
Um, we're looking for more innovation. There's tons of opportunity. Uh, we want to try new things, especially as it relates to manufacturing and agriculture. And, you know, one of the things that we're talking a lot about right now um, in government circles um, is climate change and how, the impact that that has. And, you know, one of the th I'm getting um, approached by a variety of folks, marketers who want to market Wausau as a place for climate, climate refugees, which is kind of an interesting thing to talk about. Um, but it's something that we um, we pride ourselves in is our natural um, our natural elements that you know we have lots of access to. And if it gets a little warmer than six degrees, I think some folks might be happy. Um, but really, um, and I see that Dr. Ming is on this, so uh, I hope he's all right with me using his picture here. Um, but only in Wasa and Marathon County, this is kind of the special stuff. Um, we are the ginseng capital of North America. So 95% of all American ginseng is grown right here. Um, that's about a million pounds annually, $40 million in 2020. It's huge. And um, you can see this old picture from the Historical Society showing uh, kind of that first iteration. Um, it was wild cultivated um, ginseng initially. And we continue doing that 100 years later. Uh, you can see we have lots of farmers here. So uh, we hear that the terroir of Wasa in Marathon County is adding to um, how great our ginseng is. It tastes good. It's really great for medicinal uses. Um, and, you know, we're able to grow it. You know, one of the challenges that we are facing, though, is related to some of the tariffs that we're finding. And we found a captive audience with some folks who are willing to listen to um, us uh, maybe maybe even negotiate a little bit with a small uh, small community on how we how we maybe lift those tariffs. Um, you know, there's also some of the non-tariff regulations that are challenging some of our small farmers. You know, the five hundred dollars or the paperwork they have to fill out. Or I've heard that there are some new changes um, in what's accepted um, when we export, needing to be very uh, standard sizing that might be harder for farmers, uh, especially small farmers. So we're having those conversations and really excited. Um, and I think probably the thing about Wasa and what is so exciting is that we could be um, a place where anyone can innovate. There's a lot of space. There's a lot of opportunity. We have a lot of interest. We're welcoming. Um, and I'm really excited to continue this discussion as we go on. So uh, there is the rabbit that is native to Wasa, the Eastern Cottontail. Um, Happy New Year again. Um, I look forward to hearing more about what these other mayors are working on. Um, and especially, I'm excited to hear from WEDC, who's been great partners with WASA and other communities. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for advocating for your local community. Uh, I know the small, the Jensen girls are many small, medium businesses, and they, they do not have the resource of large companies. So they, they are being impacted by the trade war tariff, and maybe their needs are not being heard. Um, but thank you for sharing that. And next we have Fan Fu Li, who's from uh, the state of Wisconsin. Fan Fu, please introduce yourself and please share. And Melinda as well. Thank you. Thank you, Minifan. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, thank you, Governor Holden and uh, Jason for inviting me back. It's uh, always an honor to speak at this important event. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, the state uh, information and then my colleague, Melinda, will talk about the whole region area. Uh, next page. So China is very important to, uh, to Wisconsin. Actually, Wisconsin is one of the you know, first few states who established sister state relationship with a, a, a province in China called Heilongjiang. Last year, um, we celebrated 40 years of, of a friendship with Heilongjiang. And both of our governor and their governor had a video speech, uh, congratulate each other. And we also had some uh, very exciting events, like cultural events. We actually had a high school kids or elementary school kids uh, in China and in, the, in Wisconsin, uh, they compete uh, through Zoom. So there was a, a lot of fun for kids. From business perspective, China is our second most important trade partner. Uh, number three, in terms of export destination, and the number one on import service. Uh, we exported $1.8 billion to China in 21, and uh, most of them are medical equipment or machinery uh, 
uh, product. In terms of agriculture, China is also our number two largest export market. Uh, we export a lot of seeds, uh, like uh, ginseng roots uh, from uh, Mayor uh, Rosenberg's area, who product bovine genetics products. So this trade supported over 13,000 jobs in Wisconsin. So um, we all realized that China is really important to Wisconsin's business. Uh, next page. So we also have Chinese investments in Wisconsin, like a Tetronic Industries. They acquired uh, a, a well-known company in Milwaukee called Milwaukee Tool, which you, know, you can buy Milwaukee tools in Manaz, you know, many, many stores yeah, all over the, the, the country. Uh, they employ almost 6,000 people. We also have a Nine Dragon paper. They, they acquired paper mills. Uh, in Wisconsin, which my colleague Melinda will talk a little more about it. And we also have a company from Shenzhen called Herbalink. They acquired a company in uh, Wisconsin, and uh, their products actually have a, a almost 50% market share in the US. So they are a very, you know, have a very strong market dominant position in their field. So they're very successful. They have been expanding after the acquisition um, a few years ago. In terms of education, um, Wisconsin has the highest percentage of Chinese students uh, among international students. So 42% of the international students are Chinese. And uh, we have a you know, college like UW Madison has over 3000 students and Milwaukee and Marquette also have over 300 students. Um, we are continuing to attract uh, China uh, investments um, and uh, Nine Dragon is an important partner. So I'm going to turn the floor to my colleague, Melinda, to, to talk about her region and talk about Nine Dragon. Thank you, Fanfu. Um, I'm Melinda Osterberg. I'm a regional economic development director um, with the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. So where FANFU um, is, has more of a state level perspective, I serve central Wisconsin and uh, Mayor Katie Rosenberg City, Wausau and Marathon County are both in my region. So I wanna thank the USHCA for the report and for facilitating um, this evening's discussion. Um, so central Wisconsin, where is that? I think that would be a, a good place to start. So Mayor Rosenberg talked about this a little bit. Um, Mosinee is just gonna be south of Wausau on this map. Um, you see um, Chicago a little bit to the south, but Milwaukee where Fanfu is based is actually very, very close to Chicago. And then you see Madison kind of in the south central part of the state. So my region extends basically from where you see that Mosinee airport all the way down to about here. So right dead center in the state. Um, as Katie mentioned, uh, my industry, the industries in my region are primarily related to agriculture and agricultural products. So we have a lot of paper and food and beverage producers. Um, paper in Wisconsin is huge. We um, are known for our paper manufacturing, um, pulp and paper mills, and um, we really lead the nation by any sort of metric in terms of paper making. Primarily the facilities are located along our rivers. So you see a cluster of facilities here in Northeast Wisconsin, and then that will be along the Fox River. And then in my region, so from Marathon County on down, um, and, and this will be along the Wisconsin River. Um, paper making and the paper industry has really um, kind of struggled a little bit. We've seen numerous facilities close and kind of the impact that has on the area's economy, um, morale, and there are a lot of social and economic issues that come up when you have a mill town um, that experiences a closure. Um, in my region, we've there were a string of closures in the early 2000s, um, all the way to a pretty serious closure in 2020 um, with Wisconsin Rapids paper mill. And um, so that's been kind of where we are, but Nine Dragons came in um, and bought the Beeren paper facility. So this was an older facility in Beeren, Wisconsin. 
um, which is gonna be just south of where Mary Arcady is kind of again in the central part of the state. And you see the beautiful Wisconsin River there and um, their historic facility. Uh, they came in and um, they bought this historic mill. It started making paper um, in, I, in the 1800s. Um, they became part of Consolidated Paper in 1911. Um, Consolidated Paper was a huge company in central Wisconsin and Wisconsin generally. They make light weighted coated papers during the 20th century. Um, so that is going to be um, catalogs, you know, brochures that you would get at a convention, that sort of glossy um, paper. Um, they won a, a Mill of the Year award in the 1980s for some of their converting operations. But then um, with the kind of declining paper industry, um, we saw mill ownership change and it changed three times. Um, and there was a lot of uncertainty about the future of the mill. Um, and then ND Paper came in and they purchased the Buren facility and then another facility in Maine. And they paid 175 million for both facilities. So you saw that 2018 number that Fan Fu provided um, about, uh, about how much Chinese investment was. And so you see that that 2018 number, a large portion of that was this ND Paper purchase of this Buren facility. So they purchased the facility and they really changed the direction and they invested in the facility multiple times, recognizing the value, the workforce that we have in central Wisconsin um, and their ability to really have an effective and welcoming business climate. So they have retained 300 full-time jobs at the facility. In 2019, they invested 189 million um, to convert the B25 paper machine from coated light mechanical paper. So that's gonna be that glossy kind of flyer mail um, to lightweight recycled packaging products. Now, if you don't know what those are, that's gonna be your, when you get like an Amazon package or some sort of box, that liner board is what they're making there. And then with the success of that conversion, in 2022, they began a process to convert their other large paper machine from that coated light mechanical paper to, again, that lightweight recycled packaging material. They also um, are constructing a, um, OCC pulping facility. So they will be using recycled pulp to make that um, liner board material. So since acquisition, we see the ND papers invested approximately 326 million in Wisconsin, in addition to those initial acquisition costs. So it's just really been an asset to the area. They've provided a lot of certainty um, to the workforce and that, you know, recognizing that incredible investment that they're going to be there for a while um, and that we don't have any worries of them closing um, or leaving us with a facility that we need to find another reuse for. In addition, um, ND Papers really has found Wisconsin a wonderful place to do business. They uh, opened a packaging facility in um, 2021. So that is kind of a history of how one company can really make a difference in a small community. Uh, I have a couple slides, just one slide on Wisconsin ginseng, and I think Mayor Katie did a great job of this. But again, as she said, 95% of cultivated U.S. ginseng is from Wisconsin. Um, most ginseng is grown in Marathon County. And um, then in 2020, um, over half of all Wisconsin ginseng exports were either to China or Hong Kong, um, which is about 18, little over 18 million. So if you remember from Fan Fu's slide, um, you can see that that would be a large, about 20% of our nuts and our roots and seeds exports um, to China. And then we have a ginseng festival, which is a wonderful event. And I encourage you all to come visit us. It looks like the next one will be in fall of 2024. We took a little bit of a break um, due to the pandemic, but we are looking at hosting that again in 2024. It's a wonderful time to see all the wonderful things we do with ginseng. There's ginseng beer uh, and a variety of food products. So um, that's kind of just how one region, small region in central Wisconsin, a rural region has really incredible connections to China. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you, Fenfu. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, one thing I'll mention that we got a lot of inquiry from our Chinese investor. As you know, EB5 has expedited track for rural agriculture related projects. So let's queue up those projects. Uh, I love the idea of the Jensen Festival. I know Mayor Rosenberg, you extend invitation for then Ambassador Qinggang to visit your Jensen farm, but he got a bigger job now. Uh, but maybe in 2024 at the Jensen Festival, we can have a delegation from China to visit your city, your region. But He's that's still invited. <laughs> great. Well, let him know. Um, but thank you so much. Now we cannot leave Wisconsin without talking about students. And Samantha works with Chinese students day in, day out. He's like their second mom in the United States. So Samantha, please tell us why China, Chinese student matter to you, matter to your university. Wonderful, thank you so much for, for um, hosting this tonight and allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Samantha McCabe uh, and I'm the director of the International Student Services Office at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and we are the, the flagship institution here in the state of Wisconsin with a really deep history of hosting uh, Chinese international students and scholars on our campus since the early 1900s. Um, but our relationship goes beyond just hosting students or the bilateral exchange of, um, of, of learning, of student learning, uh, and also expands into the research uh, and the, the teaching um, exchange as well. And, and just one more recent example in, in 2019, so pre-COVID, uh, we uh, entered into an official exchange agreement uh, with Nanjing University and the timing could not have been better for our two institutions um, and the, the regions in which we are situated because not even a year later when COVID hit, uh, we saw the strength of that partnership come through in the exchange of PPE, the, the personal protective equipment that, uh, you know, first was needed at Nanjing and then needed at UW-Madison. And, and that, you know, ex that research and equipment and, and teaching and learning exchange didn't just immediately benefit the campus of UW-Madison, but as the flagship institution of Wisconsin, it definitely benefited our entire state um, as, as we tried to come through through uh, the beginning uh, months of the COVID outbreak. Um, and I think, you know, that power in, in education and the research partnership just really enhances a cross-cultural uh, uh, awareness um, and exposure that I work with every day uh, with, with students that we host on our campus. And, and we see this as the host institution. Um, and I think there's a common... Um, maybe myth with international students studying in the US that they as individual students you know, benefit. They benefit from our, our higher education, they benefit from employment opportunities, and they return home. But it, the benefits to the host community are, are so grand and vast. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's a great benefit here in the state of Wisconsin where, you know, we really value the education of our Wisconsin residents in having such a large international student population, where we're nearly 50% of our overall student population are, are from China, um, as, as was uh, noted on earlier slides, and the, the large percentage of our international students in the state are from China. And they're enriching the lives of the Wisconsin residents whom they encounter in and out of the classroom. Um, and it's just some ways that, you know, my office as International Student Services, we try to facilitate that cross-cultural exchange beyond just the classroom and beyond just UW-Madison's campus. We have a program called International Reach, and this is a cross-cultural speakers program where we really try to enrich the lives of, of everyone in Dane County uh, and beyond. And, and um, you know, one of the greatest partnerships that we have through International Reach is with our, our K through 12 schools, our, our kindergarten, um, you know, primary, secondary uh, education systems here locally, we send our students into those classrooms to engage with, um, with young learners to share their country, their culture, and their experience as an international student here in the U.S. And, and seeing those partnerships develop year after year, um, and then eventually see those K through 12 students become UW-Madison students and 
and share the feedback of how that program enriched them uh, and really catapulted their interest in international relations um, or, you know, in, in cases where they've encountered Chinese students and in China relations uh, is really empowering. Um, and that's just one aspect of, uh, you know, kind of the co-curricular, the outside of the classroom engagement uh, that we can help to, to facilitate. One way that we do that on campus also is, you know, we we really try to cultivate this sense of belonging for our students, not only to, you know, to come together with their co-nationals, uh, with our Chinese student being so Chinese student population being so large, but also to come come together with other international students and other U.S. students who have an interest in global engagement and global affairs, and we are are lucky to. Um, to have the support uh, from our uh, our student government association, where my office is actually able to give out uh, small grants to our registered student organizations. We have about $35,000 a year uh, to give out to um, organizations to host events uh, that really promote that cross-cultural engagement. Um, in this past weekend, uh, we had um, the, the pleasure of being able to co-host and co-fund um, our Chinese Student and Scholar Association Spring Festival um, event uh, at, at our, our big student union over the weekend. Um, and just reading some of the local media coverage on that, really enhancing the, the bilateral relations between our countries through cultural exchange uh, and cultural understanding. And that's really where, you know, I think international education, and especially as we, we see the bilateral relations between China in the U.S. play out as they are and as they did under the previous presidential administration here in the U.S., it's really cultivating that sense of belonging on our campus and in our community. Um, and how can we be better advocates for our students? Um, again, you know, not only in the classroom, but also with federal regulations or um, even, you know, bringing awareness to our campus partners of some of the things that are happening in, in China that are impacting our students from China uh, so that we can all have that greater global awareness uh, to create that sense of belonging here on campus. Um, and I think, you know, that's becoming increasingly more important now. Uh, you know, when I, when I reflect on, on factors that are impacting current uh, current relations, but also impacting the future, you know, is is our enrollment of Chinese students going to continue to, to increase as it has over the past couple of years? And as we we really have rebounded very, very well at UW-Madison from COVID, but we continue to see anti-Asian sentiment throughout the U.S., including in our own community and on our own campus, um, you know, acts of hate, acts of violence, and students fear for their personal safety, as do their families who are so many thousands, thousands of miles away. Um, and so, you know, really honing in, um, you know, some of our efforts to, to create uh, a safer uh, community for our Chinese students um, is, is of topmost interest to our institution. And I also think, uh, you know, factors such as the Presidential Proclamation 10043, it's a holdover from the Trump administration with the uh, China military civil fusion strategy, uh, you know, impacting and really def not deflecting, but, um, you know, creating more barriers for Chinese students, especially at the graduate uh, and professional level education from even applying for a visa to come to the U.S. And so having some of these policy constraints is definitely impacting, um, you know, our, our, uh, our international exchange with uh, China and, and hosting Chinese students. So I'm cautiously optimistic that we will overcome that and we will continue um, to, to really uh, strengthen through educational and that personal cultural exchange uh, to continue the strong uh, connections that we've had with China over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Uh, thank you so much for advocating for the student on your campuses. And you have done an outstanding job. Uh, I think one thing you know, from discussion we had in the past, the Chinese student who had to leave US to go to Canada because they have better prospect of getting a job. They have to go to UK or Australia because they can study what they really can study. 
So there's a, a really important discussion to be had on that. Uh, but I want to make sure in the interest of time, I'm gonna to move to uh, our representative of uh, the home state of our chairman, Missouri, Tim Nowak. Tim, please, the floor is yours. And Terrific, Min, thank you. Hopefully, can you see my, uh, my slide there? Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you, Min, and thank you to the US uh, Heartland China Association. And you're exactly right. We are super proud to be the state uh, where uh, former Governor Holden uh, helped to lead us. And also we're proud of the fact that he led Missouri, the creation of Missouri's first ever office in China uh, back during his time as governor. I've traveled to China with Governor Holden in the past. Uh, and I'm also kind of proud of this whole audience here. You knew you knew exactly what uh, what we knew. We know right here in St. Louis that we are the very first city with a sister city relationship with the People's Republic of China with Nanjing from back in 1979. More on that in just a minute. Uh, but I also want to uh, just a shout out to Craig Allen and the U.S. China Business Council. You'll hear from Craig shortly. But your team moderated a panel on U.S. China relations for the World Trade Center St. Louis back in September of 2019. And it was right after that, it was October of 2019, um, when we traveled, this was my last trip to China, but we traveled to China and we celebrated our 40th anniversary of that sister city relationship with Nanjing. We broke the ground on a new hospital right outside of Suzhou that one of our medical schools had helped to consult on. And it just was one additional example of the many many relationships that St. Louis and the state of Missouri have with China. We have a long history of pioneering relationships with China. Uh, Emerson, one of our premier companies based here in St. Louis, was an early leader in international business between St. Louis and China and between the United States and China. In fact, they were one of the first 10 U.S. companies operating in China back in 1979. Anheuser-Busch invested in the Budweiser Wuhan International Brewing Company nearly 30 years ago. And many area universities have formed collaborations in China. The University of Missouri St. Louis and Nanjing University have had a partnership that dates back to the early 1990s. And one of the first and now top ranked executive MBA programs in China is the result of a partnership between Washington University in St. Louis and Fudan University in Shanghai. And when you put it all together, these institutions historically have been enrolled thousands of Chinese undergraduate and graduate students each year in St. Louis. There is no doubt that between the height of the trade war and the pandemic, uh, that St. Louis trade and investment numbers and connections have dipped from peaks of nearly $2 billion annually. And, uh, and, and, but there's no, no getting around the fact that China also was and remains a top three market globally for Missouri businesses selling their goods and their services. And this supports nearly 20,000 jobs statewide, those exports to China. And we've seen encouraging signs of new growth and opportunity, in fact, just, the, uh, just this past year, the China Construction Bank out of New York has visited two different times to our city, and they've helped to support brand new deals, business deals, between businesses in our state and in China. So it's these relationships, and along with the tremendous support from our friends at the U.S. Heartland China Association that led to a very special visit from the Chinese ambassador to the United States, Chen Gang, back in September. Min knows this all too well, we work very closely on this, but important discussions were held around the subjects of climate smart agriculture, river transportation and logistics, trade and investment and people to people connectivity. And you'll never guess it, but darn it, the ambassador even threw out the first pitch at the Cardinals baseball game. And I have friends who were texting me, telling me, hey, guess what? St. Louis is trending in China. Who would have guessed that? So that was so awesome to see. And I think it really helped to set the tone of, of you know, the many visits that the ambassador 
took upon his time as he was in office. And this is just a sampling of some of the, the uh, editorials and the, the newspaper reports that even reference the China's baseball tossing ambassador, the diplomat. But he did reference this in, in his outgoing opinion in the Washington Post. And he made mention, and I just want to read this, he made mention, and, and one of his quotes was, the future of both of our peoples, indeed the future of the entire planet, depends on a healthy and stable China-US relationship. We could not agree more. But you know, beyond that, when he was here in St. Louis, the, that visit also gave us an opportunity to formally dedicate the new Chinese baseball statue that we have right outside of Bush Stadium. And when we were in China back in October of 2019, you see the statue on the left, that is now placed in Nanjing. And that's a statue in the likeness of Cardinal Great Adam Wainwright, as he's pitching a baseball from China to the Chinese baseball batter right outside of Bush Stadium. Uh, and the, the ambassador was here to help dedicate a very thoughtful gift from our sister city to, that, to the sister city of Nanjing to, to recognize and celebrate the 40 year anniversary of that special relationship. Hopefully, Jason, we've got a video that we're gonna play, a short video that, uh, that gives you a little more background on that and hopefully we can uh, turn that over now. Well, again, we really queued up. Thank you, Tim, uh, and your local community for bringing forth such a warm reception. Um, it was a really moving. Uh, actually, I'm thinking about making that route you know, as a tour now for the next China, Chinese delegation. You know, they just go to the garden, go to the river, and watch the baseball. But Jason, please feel free to play anytime. Mama, is playing and St. Louis became sister cities in 1979. In the past four decades, ties between the two cities have grown ever closer. Jingling Library and St. Louis County Library exchanged books as gifts, which draw closer people's hearts and minds and built a bridge for mutual understanding. Cooperation and exchanges have been ongoing between Nanjing Drum Tower Hospital and BJC, as well as Washington University in St. Louis, which I hope will bring more benefits to our citizens. These two leaf trees were jointly cultivated by Nanjing and St. Louis more than 40 years ago. Now. They are thriving by Brand Lake, just like the friendship between two cities.
thank you for that wonderful video. Uh, I have to take this opportunity to thank Tim again. Also announced that St. Louis was selected to be the hosting city for the 2023 US-China Agricultural Roundtable on April 4th. So you'll hear more about that soon, but thank you, Tim, and thank you for the people of St. Louis for that friendship. Um, with that, I'm gonna actually now turn to Craig Allen, whose members represent many, many states' interest. So Craig, please weigh in on why China matters to your members. Well, thank you so very much, Mean And uh, Governor Holden, uh, thank you uh, also for giving me this opportunity. I'm going to start out as a retired US diplomat of 33 years to talk about uh, the bilateral relationship uh, between the China and the United States overall. And then I'll zoom in on the economics uh, of the heartland uh, uh, for the next uh, few minutes. Um, the United States is the guarantor of the post-World War II order. And China is a rising power within the world that is challenging uh, that order. So in political science terms, we're caught on the horns of a massive security dilemma. Neither side uh, trusts each other. Both are taking measures that they consider to be defensive, but that the other thought side uh, looks at as hostile. And this has become a vicious cycle that if left uh, unchallenged could have very dangerous consequences. These, inter, uh, these interactions are enormously uh, important going forward. Uh, we need to work together uh, to uh, address uh, global public commons issues uh, such as climate change. And uh, indeed there is uh, no more important uh, international issue that we face uh, today. So it is imperative that we get this bilateral relationship right. It is possible for the United States to decouple with China, but the cost of decoupling is that we would become much poorer as a society, as, uh, as our competitors around the world become much richer, and that is not acceptable. Not only would we become poorer if we decoupled, the pain would not be equally uh, felt. It is lower uh, income Americans who benefit from inexpensive imports and those who produce uh, on our farms and in our manufacturing facilities uh, that would lose the most with decoupling. Many of the jobs uh, uh, in the United States for export to China are based uh, in the heartland of the United States. So let me spend a couple of minutes on the economic side of the relationship. Uh, over five years ago, I retired from the Foreign Service and joined the US-China Business Council. USCBC is a membership organization composed of some 280 American companies, mostly with investments in China. And our mission is to advocate on behalf of American companies doing business in China. Uh, let me tell you why I believe that advocating on behalf of American companies uh, exporting to China and doing business in China is a patriotic uh, enterprise and why it is so important to actively defend uh, American corporate interests in this vast complex country with whom we have such a complex relationship. First and foremost, some 10% of American exports uh, go to China, and these exports uh, support employment of, of over 1 million of our fellow citizens in 2021. Exports to China from the 21 heartland uh, states supported 416,460 American jobs, nearly half a million American jobs in 2020, the latest year our state-by-state -state data is available. Each of these jobs is important. In addition, Chinese companies in the United States employ another 160,000 American citizens. Uh, Chinese companies like Fuyao Glass uh, are, are excellent um, uh, supporters of their local community and our overall national 
economy. Um, so it's uh, possible uh, that these numbers can rapidly grow. Uh, and in my view, it is important uh, that we try uh, to grow the numbers of Americans employed either exporting uh, to uh, or employed by American, uh, by Chinese companies in the United States. The second reason why this is important is that China has enormous scale. It is a, an economy about the size of Europe. And if we do not compete in this market, our companies will lose the benefit of scale, which in the business world is tantamount to losing competitiveness. So in brief, uh, if an American company is going to be a business, a, a, a global leader in business, it needs also to be a leader in the Chinese market. Third, China has grown quickly and the middle class is expanding rapidly. In total, China has contributed about 30% of uh, global GDP growth over the last 25 years. And indeed, it is the fastest growing uh, a large market. The middle class Chinese consumer loves American products brands and services. They appreciate the United States and want to send their children uh, to American colleges and universities. Fourth, the rest of the world is happy to do business with China and take advantage of the growth opportunities uh, that are in China. If the Europeans and the Japanese are doing business there and generating uh, a huge profits, while American companies are prohibited from doing so, it will have a uh, enormous long-term impact on our competitiveness, our prosperity, our jobs, and ultimately uh, our uh, prosperity. So let's look uh, a little bit deeper at the 416,460 uh, 416, uh, jobs supported by Heartland Exports to China and uh, what industries they're in. Uh, the US HCA's 21 heartland states combined exported $74.5 billion worth of goods to China in, 21, in 2021. China is a, top four, uh, is a top four goods export market for all heartland states. Then China is Nebraska, and South Dakota's top goods export uh, market. Colorado uh, saw export uh, growth to China grow 88%, while the average uh, was uh, 21%. The heartland states exported $11.7 billion in services exports in 2020, and China is a top seven service export market for every single one of the heartland states. China is Alabama and Kentucky's second largest services export market. Indiana had the highest uh, percentage of service exports to China as a percentage of their total services exports, and that was at 9%. The heartland states exports a, a, a diverse range of goods, a very diversified portfolio to China with 33 different categories of goods falling in the top five of the heartland states exports uh, to China. And they include oil seeds and grains, basic chemicals, resins and synthetic fibers, and meats. Um, there's a much greater variety of goods exports uh, than services exports. Uh, with uh, On the services side, every heartland state has an education services in their top five services exports uh, to China. In addition, royalties from industrial processes, trademark royalties, equipment installation and maintenance are also top uh, uh, services exports uh, to China. So in conclusion, uh, given the deep interconnectedness of the US and um, heartland economies uh, with China, and the many benefits of uh, the US and heartland accrue from the interconnectedness in trade, the issue should not be decoupling. We need rather to de-risk our economy. And that is a job uh, that is uh, largely done by American companies working in cooperation with our democratically elected representatives. 
ultimately, the question becomes, how do we garner the benefits of interconnection with China while managing the risks of interdependence? I suspect that we will be living with that puzzle for the rest of our lives. It's a complicated question, and its answer will require, require serious and thoughtful policymaking. I thank you for allowing me to join this group today. Let's do everything uh, that we can to ensure that we have the answers that best advance America's long-term national interests with China. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. And thank you for those powerful data. Data can be boring, but we have to be reminded there are powerful data, real trade connections below the headlines. So thank you, Craig, for those perspective. And now we actually have Amy Lay, uh, formerly representing the state of Ohio, but now last year, actually, now representing Fuya, one of the largest FDI. And I remember the governor of Ohio recognizing Fuya chairman with award for the 700 million investment, 2000 plus jobs created. So Amy, please tell us uh, what's, why China matters uh, from your perspective. Thank you, Ming. Um, so, Governor Holden, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Amy Lei, Vice President of Fuya Glass America. It is a great pleasure to join this event today. First, I'd like to thank Governor Holden for his leadership and dedication in supporting US-China relationship. I also want to thank Mr. Craig Allen for the great speech and the recognition to Fuya, uh, and also, um, you know, appreciation for all the speakers for today. Um, additionally, I want to thank Ming, Jason, and all the hard workers um, at US Heartland China Association for hosting such a successful launch event and inviting me to join. It is very important to have a platform like this so business and individuals from two sides can share information and exchange views. I would like to use um, the next couple of minutes to briefly share Fuyao's investment in the US and why China matters to the heartland and to the US. I believe many of you are familiar with Fuyao Glass and our founder and the chairman, Mr. Cao De Wang. Our chairman founded Fuyao in China and lead Fuyao to be the largest automotive glass supplier in the world. Fuyao is a Chinese company. Fuyao is also an international company. We have production facilities in 16 cities in China and 11 foreign countries. Fuyao's products are recognized and purchased by the world's top OEM, auto OEMs, such as Bentley, Mercedes-Benz, BMW, Audi, GM, Toyota, Honda, Ford, you name it. Globally, we have more than 27,000 employees in the, US, in the US globally. And in the US, we have more than 3,000 workers in five states, with Ohio being the largest manufacturing site in the US, followed by Illinois. And of course, both of these states are in our heartland states. Fuyao's investment and many other Chinese companies' investments are very important to the heartland and very important to the US economy. If you actually ask local officials and citizens in Ohio and in Illinois, they will tell you how much they appreciate for your investment and other Chinese investment. Many of the audience here um, are my old friends and know I used to work for Jobs Ohio and supported many Chinese companies' investment in Ohio. So I can actually for a minute wear my old hat and share how much local people truly appreciate the new investment from China to the US. Right here in Ohio, because of Fuyao's investment, thousands of people can actually have good paying jobs and good lives. In, 20, in 2008, now it's a little bit of the history uh, lesson. Back in 2008, GM shut down its Moraine assembly plant. Um, so at that time, it was very sad. More than 2,000 people lost their jobs. In 2014, Fuyao decided to purchase the GM building 
and remodel it to be the state-of-art facility to manufacture auto glass. And we'll continue investing more um, this year and in the future in the US. Now, Fuyao's Ohio factory has more than 2,000 workers. Fuyao's investment changed and saved many families' lives in Ohio. At that time, back in 2014 and 2015, when Chairman decided to invest in Ohio, a lot of the headline news were about hope. A Chinese company brings hope to the workers in Ohio. The local city council voted to rename the road by our factory at Fuyao Avenue to show their appreciation. Ohio Governor Mike DeWan presented a letter of recognition to our chairman, Mr. Cao De Wan, expressing his appreciation for Fuyao's important role as a civil ambassador in promoting Ohio's tie with China and U.S. tie with China. In September uh, 2022, which was last year, Foreign Minister of China, uh, former Ambassador Mr. Qing Gang, uh, he's a star of tonight's event. <laughs> Mr. Qing Gang also visited Fuyao, the Ohio factory, um, and the site Fuyao Zhongmei in the Fuyao glass made in Ohio, uh, which means uh, you know, he's recognizing Fuyao's important contributions to both China and US economy. So Fuyao is a Chinese company. It is also a US company. It's an international company supplying to global auto customers. But Fuyao is not alone. There are many, many other Chinese companies investing in the US and making significant contributions to the US economy. There are also many US companies investing in China and making significant contributions to China's economy. So it is truly a global economy. In addition to the direct investment, there are many other examples of win-win situations between US and China. For example, the education exchange, the cultural exchange, sister cities and province, trade, tourism, etc. The US Heartland China Association uh, did a very wonderful job summarizing all the key factors of each heartland state. To conclude, China matters to the heartland, China matters to US, and US matters to China as well. So from business perspective, the economy is global. We are serving global customers. Last but not least, I wish today's launch event a great success. Thank you again for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to join all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for the wonderful remarks and for representing the community of Chinese companies in the United States. It's such a great counter uh, balance. Well, again, uh, the views, you know, Craig shared as his members, you know, contributing to the Chinese, contributing to the US, but it is truly global. Um, so thank you for that. Finally, we, in this, the age of social media, short-term memory, it's really important to remember those histories. I really appreciate some of the histories. And now I'm gonna actually turn to Cindy to bring back uh, maybe some of the sister cities. I know we're running a bit behind. So please, Cindy, go ahead. Lot tonight, Min Fon. I didn't know that Wisconsin was paper and ginseng, Melinda. I just thought it was cheese and cows. So I really thank and appreciate your presentation. I thank Governor Holden for continuing to give leadership to this important topic. I love the title of this event, Min Fon, Why China Matters to the Heartland. I'm pleased to share that with you that while China mattered to Fort Hay State University, located in the middle of the heartland, I was the Assistant Vice President for Global Partnerships and retired in 2022. And it was during this tenure that I completely understood why China mattered to Fort Hay State University. So I turn the clocks back to 1999. When I received um, a call, I was the Dean of the Virtual College and I received a call from the Chinese American asking if I might be interested in offering telecourses leading to degrees in the People's Republic of China. Well, I said, I have no idea. And he said, well, make up your mind for I'm on my way to the Los Angeles airport to meet with the Minister of Education. 
Well, that's a long story, but as I said, I was looking for a job when I got this job and I looked for a job if they don't like my decision and I said yes. And it was that serendipitous event that led to the success of Fort Hay State University. So we roll the clocks ahead 20 years to 2023. Fort Hay State University started with 40 students and doubled the number of students every year. We've now graduated 18,000 Chinese students and we've sent over 150 faculty to China to live and teach. And today we're delivering six different degree programs. We've also sent three domestic students every summer to China for the past 20 years on a cultural exchange. And most importantly, we expanded from Seos International University to other partners in China and the world. So you can see that China and Seos truly mattered to Fort Hay State University. So let me explain further. Seos International University was started by Dr. Sean Chin. He was a graduate of UCLA and he wanted to give back to his native country. He was given dilapidated land to build his campus, which today has received many architectural awards. Here are pictures of the East meets West campus with architecture depicting parts of the world, including the gardens from around the world, as well as you can see Big Ben from London, and that was Russian Square a few minutes ago that, that we had on the screen. Here are a few more pictures on this next slide that shows pictures of the library that um, depicts a Western style library. Um, and you see the fountains outside, maybe looking a little bit like Bellagio in Las Vegas. But the uh, interior of the, of the library has um, lots of, of books and facilities for students. This campus is in Xinjiang, Henan province, which is a small city by Chinese standards, 900,000 population. And it's in the heartland of China. The sister state to the state of Kansas is the Henan province, which was established in the 1970s. That was just a coincidence that we started our first partnership in the Henan province, but we certainly have wanted to capitalize on it. So how does a Sino foreign education cooperation work? So Min Fon, I, I briefly went through those last slides, but again, we appreciate your including uh, Kansas in your, your webinar tonight. And I'll end with special New Year's wishes to everyone, especially the rabbits that are here on the Zoom meeting. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for um, cutting it off short. We definitely had uh, run over, but I will mention we have a surprise guest that who will help us close the event. Um, but to close it, uh, I'm going to ask each of you on a question and just simple answer. The question is, what would serve, how would you like to see your China relation develop to serve the, your interests, the interests of your member, your community, right? So first, where's Kyle? Kyle, why does China matter to you? Or where do you want to see it go? Um, as Oklahoma's musical ambassador and America's fiddling ambassador, I've got my fiddle here. Um, I've had a chance to represent the United States in over 40 countries with my music. And I think uh, we look at this, um, at, at this very current moment, this kind of soft diplomacy, the kind of cultural exchange is a, this is a kind of a season where it can really shine and really uh, fostering those friendships and those relationships. And I have time and time again, been so blessed by my relationships and my friendships and um and it matters because we are we're all uh we're all in this together and um we're all on planet earth and um we've got to work together and we've got to realize that that um that there is um there is a deep desire on behalf of people all over the world to to share a meal with us or to sing a song or have a drink or whatever it might be and so I, I just am so grateful for all my relationships in China and seeing how that those can strengthen um, the, uh, the partnerships that we have uh, in across our region. So Kyle is going to play something later, but right now one one quick answer. Uh, I know Craig, you are very busy. Everybody else, so Craig, 
how would your members' interests best, best served as you like to see you at China relation evolve? We, we need stability and predictability in the relationship so that we could advance forward together. Thank, Thank you. you. And how about Carla? How would what Chicago's interest be best served as you at China relations evolve forward? I mean, it is not just about the capital. It is also about the ecosystem and how it is built. It creates jobs, brings innovation, and it creates a better understanding about our communities. Actually, I am a alumni of Beida. Oh, so, yes. So, yeah, I am very happy being here and to meet all of you. Cecile. Thank you. We went over more than one sentence, but I'll give you the actual time because I'm from Beida too. Uh, maybe uh, Amy Lei, Amy, why? How would the interests of Fuya be served as U.S.-China relations evolve? I think well, I will simply put that um, you know we should all respect the difference, um, and it can be a win-win situation. Thank you. How about Mayor Rosenberg? How would the your city's interests be best served as you? see the relationship evolve. Yeah, I would love to invite folks to experience WASA. And of course, we've got some financial interest too. So I uh, would love to have a little bit more time to talk about that with folks who are in charge. Great, thank you. And how about Samantha? How would your students' interest be best served? Yeah, I would say um, to not use our uh, students as pawns in our political bilateral relations and agreements um, to, to really promote uh, the cross-cultural and educational exchange. Thank you. How about uh, Fen Fu, how would the interest of Wisconsin be best served? I think the U.S. and China relationship is the most important relationship in this uh, century. Um, for Wisconsin, China is a very important country for, for, for our, our, our state. And we have had like 40 years of friendship with Heilongjiang province. And we look forward to another 40 years of our, our friendship with Heilongjiang. Great. And Melinda, as a half Chinese American, uh, how would you think Wisconsin interests, your region interests be best served? I think greater collaboration um, and more cultural activities. I think that as tourism opens up, that there's a wonderful opportunity um, for Chinese people to come visit our state, um, see the investment opportunities that we have here, um, the opportunities for education. I think it's very good things are coming in the future, I think with the opening and increased tourism. Great, thank you. How about Tim? How would your St. Louis, your community be best served? I mean, it's been three years and three months since my last trip to China. That's the longest amount of time in my professional career, having not traveled there. And so we miss these people to people, this face to face relationships. So much of this really gets done at that level, not at the Washington, Beijing level. And we just really need to bring those back together, groups coming here, groups going there. Your organization can play an important role in that as well. And we look forward to that. Thank you. And finally, Cindy, how would Kansas interests be better served? I have to agree with everyone. It's the, the um, we would like to have the openness of the visa so we can have more cultural exchange. I'm like Tim. I haven't been back to China since 2019. I've been there 68 times prior to that, and I really miss all my friends there. So I know that um, eventually things will be more flexible and, the, and we'll have more exchanges going back and forth. I'm very positive and encouraged about what the future will be. So I'm happy to announce, uh, uh, Tim, we've been uh, invited to organize a delegation to China. Uh, so I'll be in touch. Finally, as a Chinese American, I came as a student. I work for a multinational from United States that had business in China. Now I work for a nonprofit, formal governor, and as a Chinese American, U.S.-China relationship has to find a way to work out. We are personally at the front line as you read the news. So every political policy rhetoric has real personal price. It impacts life, impacts jobs. So we're really proud to have you all join us today. And finally, for those who are staying on, Kyle's going to play a lovely song to send us off. So thank you again for joining us. For the members, guests, if you want to stay on, please do. And Kyle, the floor is yours. Awesome.
Well, so again, thank you for joining us. And uh, unless you want to stay on as a member yeah. guest, have a small discussion and have a good rest of your evening, rest of your day. Thank you so much for your time. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you.